Gertrude. Gertrude, do you know what I just saw? I saw hooligans. Hooligans. There were these young men who should have been working in the fields. They were standing outside of the soda shop, loitering, doing nothing but loitering. And do you know how they were dressed in suits like a dignified person should be? Oh, no, no, no. They're wearing the new blue jeans and they have the bottom folded up. Why? Nobody knows. And T-shirts. Shirts that should go underneath your suit. They are wearing them out in front of the whole entire world to see. I tell you, Gertrude, our culture is doomed. 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 I tell you. Doomed. They were hooligans standing outside the soda shop. I was afraid walking by them. Because you know, idle hooligans, you don't know what's going to get in their mind and what they're going to do next. Even the ones inside, you know what they were doing? Dancing. Mm-hmm. They were. They were dancing to the jukebox music. Even girls. Where is the dignity, Gertrude? Where? I ask you, what is going to happen to our culture? I'll tell you. Back in my day, back in my day, we didn't wear those kind of things. I wore a dress every single day of my life. Well, I know we didn't have any other clothes in the Great Depression. That's not the point, Gertrude. And I tell you, back in my time, Young men would be doing useful employment. They would be working in the fields or they'd be doing a job to help their families. That was the right thing to do. Well, I know we had to do it because it was the depression. That's not the point, Gertrude. But I tell you, do you know what I saw on TV the other day? The Ed Sullivan Show. Ed Sullivan, a dignified American man. Do you know who he put on his show? I don't know if I will ever watch it again. I tell you, I had a bowl of soup in my hands, and if I hadn't had a bowl of soup in my hands that would have ruined my dress, I would have dropped it and swooned and fallen straight on the floor. I might have even had a heart attack. Elvis. Who names their child Elvis? I ask you, what were those parents thinking? This boy named Elvis got up in front of the entire world started strumming his guitar, and did he stand in front of the microphone and sing like a dignified, normal person? Oh, no. He jerked and flailed as if he had 75 ants in his pants and he couldn't get any of them out. I tell you, Gertrude, we are doomed. Doomed, because the girls that were watching him were squealing and shouting and waving their hands in the air, and some of them were swooning. I tell you, I just... Girls need to stay home and make soup, and mend their socks, and maybe make a quilt on Friday night. That's what girls on Friday night should do, because that's what we did back in my day. Well, I know we didn't have any place else to go, Gertrude. That's not the point. You are very difficult to have a positive conversation with sometimes. I tell you, I tell you, all of you, I'll tell those hooligans. I just don't know what's gonna happen to our future. I just don't know. And do you know what else? They've got this new dance and they call it the twist. And they start going like this, back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, just gyrating around like hooligans. And do you know what? The girls are in on it too. And sometimes those girls, they'll have fun, fun, fun till her daddy takes the tear it away. Oh, did I just do that? It's contagious, Gertrude. Oh, I hope nobody saw me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home and make some soup. I'm going to some socks. Maybe I'll make a quilt. I'll see you later, Gertrude. Oh, not even the fabulous 50s, the nifty 50s. It was a decade of fun and bright colors and cheerful things. It wasn't a perfect decade. There was some stuff in it that needed to get dealt with. We're actually going to push most of that off to the next decade. And this year, this week, we're going to focus on the fun, fabulous, awesome 50s. Now, you remember, the war had just finished not that long ago. There are men who worked, men who died, men who fought, sacrificed for our country to be free, and we won. The good guys won, the bad guys lost, it's over, let's celebrate and live a happy, good life. The population in the 1950s was 151 million. The average salary for the year was roughly $3,000. And that was typically for the whole family, because typically the man went to work, 
and the wife stayed home with the kids. It was a time of great ethics and great growth. So let's learn about it. Now, as you know, the war had happened and it was over. During the war, Hopi, could you hit the lights over there? During the war, America and Russia, the Soviet Union, we were together because we were fighting a common enemy. But now that the war is over, there's a problem. Yep, that one and this one too. Thank you. <sighs> We've entered this thing called the Cold War. So there's this threat that now the people who used to be on our side, eh, it's kind of like you're playing on a playground and you want to beat this other person. And so you're like, hey, you guys want to team up and we'll go beat that person. So you go and beat that person, but then you look over at the other person and you're like, oh, now it's you and me. And that's kind of what was happening. And the world was, it was a little bit scary. And it happened. So the thing that people were still worried about that Churchill kept warning about was communism, the new enemy. Now, Hitler had been taken care of. Germany had been taken care of, but this communist thing was thriving. What are we going to do about it? It's like, well, let's just hold off and hope it's all okay. Well, it wasn't okay. Korea became a place of war. What happened was after the war, I won't get into all the details. You can study it yourself. But after the war, basically the allies started piecing in part, you know, things together. I'll be in charge of this. You be in charge of this. I'll be in charge of this. Germany itself was split into four had four different people in charge of it, four different countries. Korea was the same way. We had South Korea, which was under us, and North Korea, which was under the communists. And in 19, you know, around 1950, they started coming down and attacking and basically trying to take over all of Korea. That's what the Korean War was about. There's not a ton of information in the sense that people have studied it like World War II or World War I or even Vietnam. It's known as the Forgotten War. Because for one, the culture was kind of like, we're done. We don't want to talk about it. For another, the whole entire country wasn't involved. There were some people, <laughs> guys would go off to war and come back three years later. They're like, oh, where have you been? I was in Korea. What were you doing there? So it wasn't a whole national unified thing. And it lasted three years. It was kind of like this big push. The communists got down to here. Well, then they got back up here and then it got back down to here. And in the end, it settled right about in the middle where it was to start with. But what that meant was we kept communism from taking over the first time it tried. That was the big deal was if communists start taking over places and if they win, they're going to keep taking over places and they're going to keep taking over places. And now we're back to the same problem of somebody trying to basically, you know, take over the world. General MacArthur about the Korean War said, we win here or lose everywhere. If we win here, we improve the chances of winning everywhere. That was the point. That's the reason we did it. And there are men who talk about going out there who say it was worth it because of all the people in South Korea that stayed free and that they were willing to go. And one of them even went back, went to Korea, and the people were just overwhelmingly thankful and they loved America and they were so grateful to them for fighting and keeping them free. It's, it's a big deal what happened. There's a monument for the Korean War. It says, our nation honors her sons and daughters who answered the call to defend the country they never knew and a people they never met. And this is the evidence of why it was worth it in a sense. If you, this is from right now, not literally right now, at nighttime, you can take a picture from a satellite this is South Korea. It's lit up. It's modern. It's free. That's North Korea. The lights are out in every way you can think of, not just physically, figuratively speaking. They are under terrible oppression, terrible communist rule. It, it's really, really bad. You can watch some videos of people who have tried to escape or who have successfully escaped, and they can tell you just how bad it is. But the reason, basically, this is kind of, <laughs> kind of a visual of democracy versus the communist system. How does, what is the result? What is the consequences? Oh, but the Korean War finished. We pulled out, came back home. It's like, okay, we're done with war. Let's have fun. Let's just live life. Let's make it good. So they did. The Nifty 50. The Nifty 50s were kind of like starting over with this great new country, and we won, and now we're wealthier and we've got more time we've got cars to go places in and so the culture had this huge change remember before the war it was the great depression 
So people were just trying to get by, and now they don't have to get by anymore. This is my grandpa. He came home. He got married to my grandma, and he went to college. He was able to go. He went to Bob Jones. He went on the GI Bill, and the GI Bill was this thing that the president and the government did to help the guys coming home because so much of the population went overseas. When they came back, it was like we've got these young guys. They're ready to start families. Let's build our let's build our nation. Let's make it. Let's help them do that. So if they needed a loan to buy a house, or if they needed college funds, the government under the GI Bill provided for them to do that. So homes sprouted up all over the place, these little cookie cutter houses in what became known as the suburbs. And a new home was about $5,600, which, you know, <laughs> that'd be nice. Nice little homes, you can tell people aren't buying humongous big houses. They, they're starting their families. This is good. And so they started these neighborhoods. They, it wasn't in the city. Now, in the city, there were issues and problems. But out here, it's kind of like they created this nice, happy world, neighborhoods, neighbors, families. And they had babies. This generation was called the baby boomers because all these guys came home from war, millions of guys. And they got married and they started families all at once. Usually the baby thing, it spreads out over a few years, but we missed five years. So now it's like, okay, we're gonna start having babies and boy, did they have babies. There was never so many babies in one chunk of time in the history of America. This is the statistic. So 1940, these are the babies way down here. <laughs> Just a few of them. By 1945 during the war, you know, a few. And then look, the war ends. And it's just going crazy, babies all over the place. And so that generation is like my parents. So your grandparents are probably baby boomers. You should ask them about that. So there were lots of kids, lots and lots and lots of kids. And there was new stuff. In the 50s, what was invented? The refrigerator was invented. Now, life before a refrigerator, think about how much work you have to do. And now all of a sudden you have a refrigerator. You don't have to go to the market every single day. You can put stuff in here. So now you can, oh, and it's so exciting. So exciting. The blender was invented. The electric oven was invented. The electric clothes dryer was invented. The dishwasher was invented. Hallelujah. God bless whoever did that. <laughs> so now all these things that used to take up so much time for a woman who was a housewife, now she had all these wonderful, like, gadgety type things. And she could get it in pink or avocado or green. That's where every once in a while if you go into one of those old houses and you're like, um, the bathtub is pink <laughs> and everything in this whole bathroom is like Pepto-Bismol. That's where it came from. So it was an exciting time. They had more money to spend. They had a car where they could actually go on vacations. This was a new thing. It was a big deal. And they had more time thanks to all these wonderful gadgets. So families were doing things together. They were going places together, traveling around. It was really a happy time. <laughs> Sports became a thing, not just being in sports, but watching sports, which is something our culture is very, very, very into. At this point, we pay them millions and millions of dollars so we can watch them throw a ball around. Well, at that time, it was kind of a new idea, go and sit there and watch somebody else run around. And so one of the people said it was gregarious, uproarious, and agreeably sedentary to spectators. Sedentary means you can just sit there and do nothing. So basically, you can sit there and do nothing and watch somebody else run around and you get to have all the fun. <laughs> No sweat, literally. First, the first McDonald's. Voila, 15 cents a burger. The first Dunkin' Donut. Ooh. Now see, some of these were cropping up because again, people are traveling and that's a new thing. So they're not close enough to home to make their lunch. So if you have a place that can make lunch and you can get it, that, that's really cool. Hallie? One of the big things about um, the 50s is the sign. Mm -hmm. Well, you needed people to see it from really far away. The hula hoop became a big craze. People were doing the hula hoopy and big groups and little groups, and it was just like a really big deal. The books that came out in the 50s, some really, really great ones. 101 Dalmatians, Danny and the Dinosaur. Have any of y'all read that? I love that book. Great. There's another one about a seal. They were awesome. Charlotte's Web, My Side of the Mountain, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. C.S. Lewis wrote his books for his nieces and nephews who had gone through World War II. In fact, I believe they got farmed out, just like the kids in the language in the wardrobe. They sent them out of the city to some random person so that they would stay more safe. Yes? 
If it's great. So the guy, the person who he asked to publish it only would publish it if he made it a series. And he said it, he thought it was going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and he was wrong, because all the kids enjoyed it. The movies that came out in the 50s were some of the best ever of all time, in my personal opinion. They were into epics at that time, because there was the drive-in movie theater. So you'd drive your car, and you'd park it, and there was this humongous movie screen. And so these big epic movies with thousands of extras in it, and they didn't have, like, CGI and all that stuff. So if they wanted to make a big epic movie about, like, the Israelites leaving, you needed, like, 3,000 people, and you had to actually put 3,000 people out there. It's really exciting, great movies. Ten Commandments is one of them. Ben-Hur is another one. If you've never seen Ben-Hur, the old one, not the new one, you have to wait, Ellie. Watch that. In fact, I'm sending links to all of these to your parents. Um, you can rent them on YouTube for a few dollars. The Rogue was another one. This is another one of our favorites. They made a lot of Christian-based movies during the 50s, which was pretty fabulous. Um, and the Ten Commandments, it's got some extra stuff, you know, where they had to fill in the blanks and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't have anything like, like that new Noah movie where you're like, what? Did you read the Bible at all? Born Yesterday is another really fabulous movie. It's about this really dumb girl who's a girlfriend to a guy who's moving up in the world, and so he hires this other guy to make her smart, and she's hilarious to watch. But basically, he kind of teaches her what it means to be an American. He takes her to, like, Capitol buildings. He reads things to her. He's like, this is the way we think. This is the way it works. And she learns she doesn't have to be just a dumb girl and have some other guy to make all the decisions for her. She can think for herself. It's a really great movie. Cinderella, Godzilla. Godzilla is hilarious. Even just watching 30 seconds of it, it's basically like you just took a plastic toy and ran it through like a Lego set, basically, and we're supposed to freak out. But I guess if you were in a drive through and it was really big, maybe it would almost be scary. <laughs> the TV was a big new thing for the 50s. In the beginning of the 50s, only 9% of people owned one, the families. So only about 1 in 10. By the end of the decade, it was almost 90%. That, like, massive change. It was basically this huge thing that just, woo, went crazy. And so people watched TV together, just like they used to sit around the radio and listen to the radio as a family. Now they're sitting around the TV and watching TV as a family. This is a whole family thing. And so the, the programs and stuff are geared toward the family. In fact, at the very beginning, they were kind of asking people to come on and make programs because they didn't have stuff. The biggest famous program of this decade was I Love Lucy. In fact, it was so popular, <laughs> there was even a store that put a sign up and said, we love Lucy too, and so they were going to be closed when Lucy was on TV. Back then, a program was on when it was on, and that was it. So if you weren't home, you missed it. So people would arrange their schedule. If they really liked a program, you would arrange your schedule around it. The music of the 50s. Love the music of the 50s. I wish I could play some for you, but this doesn't do any sound. But you know songs like, rock and rock and tweet, tweet, tweet. You know that song? It's basically a bunch of like cheerful, it's got a fun little beat, makes you want to bop your head to it. And there were dances <laughs> that they did. The twist was the big one, but there were some other dance moves that, wow, yeah. I'm not sure if the word dorky had come out yet. I'm going to teach them to you. You ready? Everybody stand up. <laughs> Microphone singing in harmony these cute little sweet songs. You are going to learn the mashed potato. The mashed potato move is exactly like it's called. So put your hands in fists, turn to the side, and you're gonna mash the potato. <laughs> gonna mash potato to the twist. Okay, the other one was the wave. So, you know, lots of surfing movies and the Beach Boys and stuff. And another one, I don't know what it was called, but you basically did this. <laughs> <laughs> so, now you are equipped to dance in the 50s. You can have a seat. So, it was kind of like sweet and fun music, innocent, and then this guy showed up. And Elvis pretty much single-handedly changed the music scene. Just like, like that. <laughs> and he pretty much invented rock and roll. This was a new phrase, rock and roll, that people hadn't heard of before. And it was a big, huge, big deal. He did go on the Ed Sullivan Show. And in fact, the second time he went on the Ed Sullivan Show, it was so controversial what he did, they would only film him from the waist up because he used to do all that dancing that was so scandalous for the time. <sighs> 
So that began the whole rock and roll craze. There were a ton of groups, um, lots of really awesome black groups. The music of the 50s is fantastic. Uh, but you'll notice that, again, there were black groups and there were white groups, and they even made different kinds of music. The big dance craze that started was the jitterbug, which I'm not going to teach you because people get thrown around all over the place. Um, they had jukeboxes in the soda shops, and they would dance, and it was like swinging the girl around or throwing her over your shoulder or doing flips and stuff. I don't know how people learned how to do this. I can only imagine when they were practicing how fun that would have been. Whoops, sorry. We need to fix the ceiling. So this is what the drive through looked like. You would park your car, and again, this is usually a family thing. The whole family goes together. You park your car, you watch the drive through Maybe somebody comes by selling popcorn or whatever. I think they even had little things that would fit on the side of your car that you could put your cup in and stuff like that. It would be so much fun. This was the clothing of the time, the stuff that was very in style. Tessa, come here. I want to show you what a poodle skirt looks like. And I'm so glad somebody wore one because I didn't have one. Come on all the way up here so everybody can see your skirt. The big fad was the poodle skirts. So it was these big skirts that had crinolines underneath and they would have a little something on the bottom that was what you liked, a poodle or a whatever, thank you. Just like dice or something like that. In fact, when I worked at a 50s diner at Six Flags when I was in college, my sisters and I worked there. I'm gonna show this around because it's a 50s diner. It's where the rest of the white cars look like and a lot of our outfits are appropriate as well. She's got a poodle skirt and a head dice on. So you want to pass that around and you can know there. It's also I want to pass around is a picture of the A-bomb. That's from the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida. So this was the big style of the time if you were more of the mom age. So my dress would be fine, but I actually look very scandalous because my legs are bare. I'm not wearing silk stockings or nylon stockings, which would be just horrified, and my toes are also showing. You would not wear open-toed shoes. You would wear closed-toed shoes because it's scandalous to show your toes. Yeah. But then the younger girls started changing things. This was the decade when the teenager was invented or created or came to life, whatever you want to call it. The kids who were y'all's age had time, maybe for the first time in this whole entire century. They had time to kill and have fun. They had a little bit of money to spend. And that created this whole subculture of people who wanted to have fun and had some money to do it. And they would get together and have teenageness. So the teenage look was very different. You remember up until now, the guys have been wearing suits. And there's not any point in mentioning what the guy's style looks like because you always look the same. And now things have changed. The blue jeans are a big deal and they rolled them up. And the t-shirts were a big deal and they rolled those up. And then you had a leather jacket. This is like bad boy look. So right now we're like, yeah, whatever. So Tate, he looks, he looks like a bad boy. So I would be telling my kids, stay away from Tate. Stay away from him. He's not the kind of guy you should be hanging around. Another thing that came to be a fad was the sweater look. So again, they used to be wearing suits, and you go to college, and when you go to college, you know, you go to class in a suit or in a nice dress. Well, now you notice they're wearing kind of poodle skirts and sweaters. The guys are wearing sweaters. This is a new thing, and it was a pretty cool trend. And they also, <laughs> they called them the Bobby Soxers, the girls, because they started wearing socks instead of those little pumps that all the women wore. They wore little flats and little socks that they kind of folded over, and they called them Bobby Socks. Do you want to know why? Look it up. This was another fad. The reason I posted this was so that you would know stuff that looks cool right now is going to look stupid down the road, just so you know. This was very cool. So they had normal pants, and they rolled them all the way up to here, and they went bunchy and weird, and that was really cool. It looks cool. Okay. And if enough people wore it right now, it would become cool again, because that's the way fads work. <laughs> this was another trend. Telephone booth stuffing. <laughs> How many people can you stuff in a telephone booth? And the record was 34. Oh, I would throw up. Okay, politics. I want to teach you about these guys. Whew, I wish I had more time. Mr. Ike. Eisenhower. <laughs> you remember that. Ike was one of seven sons. And interestingly, all of them were called Ike. Little Ike, Big Ike, Middle Ike. I don't know. So him being called Ike was kind of a no big deal thing. Yes. Thank you. So Ike's mom was religious. 
Christ, he ended up becoming a Jehovah's Witness. But when he was a little kid, they read the Bible every day. They had chores to do. They were disciplined if they did wrong. It was a very traditional household. And he said of himself that he was one of the most religious men that he knew. He was baptized as a Presbyterian as an adult. So when he was in high school, he almost got his leg amputated. He got this infection, and it was so bad that the doctor said, if you don't amputate his leg, he's going to die. And he wouldn't let them do it. And somehow he survived, surprising everybody. Uh, but it's a good thing he kept his leg because he needed it. He proposed to his wife on Valentine's Day. And their wedding, which was scheduled for November, I believe, had to get bumped up to July because of the war. Which war? Korea. I would guess probably World War One, when he was younger. They lost their first gun to scarlet fever. When he was older, after he was the president and everything, he liked to do oil paintings. In fact, he did 260 paintings in the last 20 years of his life. And he was a conservative and traditional, like a lot of us. So when he saw modern art, which came about later in later decades, he said, <laughs> it looks like, quote, a piece of canvas that looks like a broken down tin Lizzie loaded with paint has been driven over it. Go on. <laughs> Okay, he was a major general in World War II. In fact, he's the one who planned the Africa invasion as well as our side of the D-Day invasion. So, like, huge, hugely important in the war. And after the war, when they started liberating the concentration camps and discovering how horrible the Holocaust was, everybody was blown away. People did not expect this. American soldiers came across concentration camps, and some of them threw up. Some of them are crying. You know, just had no idea this kind of stuff was happening. And Eisenhower, having a good sense of, I don't know, human nature, I suppose, thought, you know, someday people might say this never happened. That's happening right now. Now that the Holocaust people are almost all gone, some people are saying, no, it never really happened, which is awful. So he made them go in and document all kinds of stuff on purpose for that very reason, so that we could keep history and people wouldn't be erasing it down the road. Good foresight. All right, this was his two elections. So obviously he was extremely well liked, except in the deep south. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, he created NASA on purpose, but then when they kept spending more and more and more crazy amounts of money, he got frustrated with them and he said, quote, anyone who would spend 40 billion in a race to the moon for national prestige is nuts. <laughs> he also created interstate highways. So he's a busy guy and he did a lot. Okay, super quick, because we got other things to do. The bad stuff about this decade, Nuclear bombs. The threat of nuclear war was always with us. So you've got these little kids doing, instead of like fire drills, they did nuclear bomb drills. So it's like ding, 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 hide under your desk and cover your head. How effective is that going to be against a nuclear bomb? Yeah. None. But they were doing this. They were making kids do this like in the hallways. There was a video called Duck and Cover. You can watch it on YouTube. I thought I'd watch it because I'm like, oh, the 50s, that'll be cute. It was terrifying. Seriously terrifying. It's telling these kids things like, you know, you're not always going to be with your parents, and so you need to learn how to take care of yourself in the event of a nuclear explosion. So if you're out on the streets with your sibling and you see a light brighter than the sun, you throw yourself into the nearest corner of a building and put your jacket over your head so you don't get burned by nuclear radiation. Awful. And then cute little songs. Duck, cover, ducky, cover. Like, oh, my word. So these kids who grow up in this world, so you got the generation who fought in the war, they're highly traditional, they have big sense of duty, we did the right thing, we're going to build our families, we're going to build this country. They've got a strong sense of values. But think about their kids. Their kids, in some sense, were kind of raising themselves while dad was to the war and mom was off in the factories, and now that they're home, we've got to do duck and cover things because the nuclear bomb may blow up any second. So these kids were growing up with a different system than their parents were. Remember that, because when they become teenagers in the 60s, there's going to be consequences these poor little children. So this is what it looked like. Then there was the polio outbreak. Huge big deal. Polio was a problem pretty much every summer. So there was times if somebody got it, then the kids in that area had to stop playing together. You know, don't go swimming in the lake together. Don't hang out because nobody knew how it was spread. But it was hugely, hugely contagious with children. So little babies, little kids, that was a problem. And in the 50s, there was an outbreak like never before. One got sick, 20 got sick, so it, it turned into an epidemic. And so kids that summer was like, you have to stay inside. 
You can't go outside. You can't open your window to talk to your friends. And remember, there's like probably no air conditioning and stuff. So like you're stuck inside. You can't do anything because they're so scared that you're going to catch this. And it was very valid fear. If you did catch it, oh my gosh. it got to your lungs. Polio would fill up your lungs and you would basically drown. You couldn't breathe. Your lungs stopped working. And so somebody created the iron lung. That's what this is. And you had to be in it and it breathed for you. Pressure and pushing. There's all kinds of science involved. It kept you alive. If it turned off, you died. Now, a lot of kids survived. They got through this period and they got better and they were able to get better. A lot of kids didn't. A lot of kids wear braces the rest of their life. Um, FDR with polio, he was in a wheelchair the rest of his life. Um, some kids could never leave the iron lung. In fact, I believe the last living iron lung person was in Hickory, North Carolina, and that she was still alive 10 years ago, as far as I know. But she's still in an iron lung, and she was in her 70s, and she'd been in it, what, 60 years now? And so it was a big deal. But interestingly, God always can bring good out of bad. Um, this just, it's so sad. It's so terribly, terribly sad. Um, they would try to, you know, come up with ways that kids could read books or look through a mirror so they could see people coming in. It was just, it was terrible. Okay, let's talk about the good stuff then. This is Eleanor Young. She's actually a friend of mine. She had polio when she was little. She had bad legs. She had the braces, etc. Somebody came to their church to talk about missions, and she went forward to be a missionary. And somebody in her church was super embarrassed and apologized to the missionary that the only person who went forward was a cripple. She went to the mission field. She became a missionary. She's still alive today. In fact, if you'd like to write her a letter, I have her address. I could send it to her. But there's a thing on YouTube about her. It's about 20 minutes long. It's so worth watching. I'm going to send the link to your parents. This lady as well. She had polio. She had braces. She also had scarlet fever, measles, mumps double pneumonia, et cetera, et cetera. She was a sickly little kid, and she was like the youngest of 19 kids, um, and it was hard to get care for African-Americans. So she was in big trouble when she was little. She overcame it and ended up getting a gold medal in the Olympics as a runner. A runner. So how did she get from the braces to running in the Olympics? I'll send you a link to that one, too. She's worth studying. This is the guy who came up with the vaccine for polio. Now, whatever you think about vaccines now, Back then, people were dying all over the place. The children were dying every single year, and they desperately needed a vaccine. This had been going on for about 50 years now, this polio thing. He came up with a vaccine. He was a Jewish child of immigrants. I have a feeling he kind of understood a lot about oppression, and he wanted to help the kids. So when he made this vaccine, he didn't get a patent for it. He didn't make money for it because he wanted it to be used for good. That's a hero. And so, it worked. Polio has been eliminated in America as long as you get the vaccine. Now, I know a guy who was in college. He was in a wheelchair, and he had polio, and it was because his parents couldn't afford the vaccine when he was a kid. So basically, it's eradicated because of that man. Okay, Lego was invented, and peanuts began in the 50s. I have, like, the first two books. They're so adorable. The drawings are so cute. I got these from the Morgan County Library in Madison, Georgia. You can go and check a bunch of them out and read them. Norman Rockwell was a thing. He did paintings that were like the sweet and sentimental side of America. I love his paintings. <sighs> All right, the weird. Mr. Potato Head was originally stuff you put in a real potato. <laughs> How creepy is this picture? I'm just like, oh, why would anybody buy that? But they marketed it as fun for the whole family because you could do carrots or potatoes or cucumbers. I'm like, precursor to the veggie tails, you know? Um, and then you could use them on all the other various food that you had in the house. Uh, the telephone. I had to show you this. This is the telephone of the 50s. This was the newest, you know, coolest thing. You could put it on the wall, and it had a cord that went like that. It was so great. So you could even walk around like two whole feet. Big deal. I have to show you this. This is a newspaper thing that somebody did in the 50s. I want you to listen to what it says. Prediction about the future. The telephone of the future. Mark Sullivan, San Francisco, president and director of the Pacific Telephone and Telegraph Company, said in an address Thursday night. Here's what he says about the telephone of the future. Just what form the future telephone will take is, of course, pure speculation. Here is my prophecy. In its final development, the telephone will be carried about by the individual, perhaps as we carry a watch today. 
It probably will require no dial or equivalent, and I think the users will be able to see each other if they want, as they talk. Who knows? But what it may actually translate from one language to another. Just yesterday, I went to Dos Amigos with a lady who did not know English, only Spanish, and we used a phone and had a conversation back and forth because it translated. So whoever this dude is, he is very smart. <laughs> okay, this is the end of that. You take a look at that, and we'll get to why you're taking a look at it in just a minute. Okay, now, we are in the middle. We are halfway through with this course. It's time to see if you actually learned anything. I sure hope so. And so do you. Another thing in the 50s that was a big craze was the Frisbee craze. So, let's go back all the way to 1900 and see what you remember. Who can tell me what was going to drop poison on the earth and kill everybody? Anybody remember the name? Alex Don't say that like everything. It was Alex Connor. Touch. All right. Which president was shot and died eight days later? And he said, God's will be done. Ooh, he was the first president we learned about. I want to be a first finger, huh? Yep. Nope, the one right before him. Nope. It starts with the look. McKinley. Good. Who had a bear named after him? Violet. Good. Who was first in flight? Yes. And? And his, and his brother, whose name is Orville. Woo! You have to go after that one. All right. Which states claimed Orville and Wilbur Wright as being first in flight? North Carolina and Ohio. Very good. North Carolina and Ohio. <laughs> all right. The 1910s. What was the war to end all wars? Yes. I'm going to hurt somebody. Okay. Name three people in World War One that we see again in World War Two. Can anybody think of three people? Oh. Ooh. Give me a back. Who is it? Who's the bad guy? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Who flew across the Atlantic in the city of St. Louis? Famous pilot. Good looking skinny guy. Oh. Yes, Lindenberg. <laughs> Sorry, <no. laughs> What's the place where people listen to jazz music and drink illegal liquor? What's it called? Meadow. Remember? It was, well, sort of, but that's not what it's called. Do you know about this game? <laughs> Glad these aren't like really heavy. All right. What was the term for the girls who wore short skirts and makeup? What were they called? Blackie. That's right. Good. What does anybody remember the name of the book that made everybody panic because the Martians were landing? I'll give my frisbee back. Yes. <laughs> I never was good at frisbees, just so you know. All right. Where did most people move during the Great Migration after the Dust Bowl? How many? Which one? Like which state? Yeah. Good. Somebody name a food that people ate during the Great Depression. If you've already got a frisbee, keep your hands down. Meadow. Yes. Jello, peanut butter, and onions. Mac and cheese. That's a good one. All right. Who did the fireside chess? He was a president during World War II. Fireside, Fireside Chats was on the radio. He also said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. He also said, this day which will live in infamy and declared war. Oh, man, all the people with Frisbees know. Oh, FDR, good job. All right. Who was the woman who flew across the Atlantic and then went missing her plane? Amelia. Very good, Amelia Earhart. 
Who is the little girl who cheered people up in the movies during the Great Depression? Three. Shirley Temple. Good. If you have a frisbee, put it on the table so I can see. All right. The people in Britain send in their silk ration cards for whose wedding dress? Yes. Yes. Good. <laughs> he doesn't. Name three things rationed in World War II. Mm. Oh, you already got one. We're running out. Yeah. Eggs, butter, and sugar. Beautiful. Who is the only president to serve three terms and the only president to serve four terms? Yes. FDR. Good. Thank you, Daniel. What disability did FDR have? What was his problem? We just talked about it. Jamie. Polio. Very good. <laughs> All right. Those of you who are left, stand up. If you don't have a frisbee, tell me, who can tell me the biggest decade for unemployment? I know. It's also the decade of the Great Depression. Which decade was that? <laughs> Close. Yes, 1930. Okay. Uh, which was the biggest decade for illegal drinking because of prohibition and all the flappers and the speakeasies, the roaring? Yeah. Ooh, hey, that's the nifty fifties right now. The roaring twenties. Very good. When? Which decade was World War One? You remember? It was right before the pandemic. So the 1900s were the ones with lots of inventions and everything, and in the 1910s, not so much. Yes. <laughs> Which decade was World War II? Now it just got finished. We know it did because the 50s started. So we just went before the 50s. Yes. And which decade was called the Nifty? Which one are we talking about right now with all the music and the cars and the fun stuff? Yes. All right. So, good job answering questions. Now, it's time for a challenge. If you have written a full page answer to any worksheet, like a whole page, I want you to come up here. You don't need to bring your frisbee. Just yourself. No. Yourself. No. Okay, that's a lot. All right. Y'all are going to be the watchers. I'm going to tell you about the challenge. You may look at the challenge and you may choose whether or not you wish to do it or not. It's called a five second challenge. There's all kinds of topics on here women's suffrage, the Dust Bowl, the Scopes Monkey Trial, women in the home front, capitalism, socialism, prohibition, stock market, World War One, II, all kinds of stuff. You're going to look at it. And I want you to see if you can come up with a topic that you can explain in five seconds. Like, the whole thing. You have five seconds. All right? So, take a look and pick a topic. And if you pick a topic, go over there and think about it. In fact, you're going to get them in a line, and we'll do it one at a time. If you don't want to do it, you just go sit down. You ready? All right. Okay. All right. Everybody else can sit down. Here's how this is going to work. You're going to come up here. You're going to stand right there. When it's your turn. And you get five seconds to explain something, whatever your topic was. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to ding it, and as soon as I ding, you guys stop talking. And we're going to see who does the best full explanation in five seconds out of everyone. Okay, you ready? Get set. The Titanic hit an iceberg, which gouged through five thingy and a song. Good job. <laughs> Monkey Child was evolution versus creation. 
Woo! You didn't even get five seconds. Good job. Run. And go. Okay, that's what was, the land was over pond, so it created a huge sandstorm. Yes! Good. Come on. Okay. We um probably got something that we did wrong and we just agreed with it. Great. Don't lose the spot and then we have so much and then he finally made it one. Yeah, good job. <laughs> the Titanic was a luxury ship that hit an iceberg and sunk. Alright, good. Women's suffrage movement was right for women versus um women right for women. Good. The first monkey trial was evolution of being exclusionary. Good. Very good. Give everybody a hand. That was better than I expected. Good job being in science. Okay. You can decide who did the best job in the about it later. All right. Your worksheet. Turn it over to the back. On the back it says, lessons from history. What are we through at this point? And hopefully we've learned some things about history as a whole, not just individual things that happen. There's some lessons to be learned about humanity as a whole. And that's what we're going to write down now. As we go through future dictates, we can think about, oh, yeah, there it is again, there it is again. So here we go. I hope you have a pen or a pencil. And you're going to write the answer. If you don't have a pen or a pencil, you can borrow one from someone nearby. Maybe you'll have to share. Why are we in the video? Yeah. I will also email this video to your parents so you don't get to call and catch it later. All right, number one, there is always something to panic about. Whether it's Haley Comet or Newton War fans, there's always something to panic about. So don't panic. Global warming, you know, the use of plastic straws is going to kill the world and all the polar bears. Don't panic. Number two, says blank and blank come and go and are often ridiculous. Bad. And ideals. And that's important to remember because the facts we can see. Bell bottoms or like weird hair or weird clothes. It's like, no, that's a bad, that's ridiculous, that's going to fade. But the ideals do too. The things to be scared of, the things to be mad about, the things that are like a big, huge deal. Those change come and go too. So don't get too worked up about them. Number three, blank reveals who people really are. Crisis. When there's a war, when there's a depression, when there's a dust bowl, it shows who people really are. The ones who can handle it, the ones who've got God on their side, and so it gives them strength. Number four, corruption shouldn't surprise us because we live in a sinful world. We shouldn't get all freaked out and surprised when somebody shows up to be a sinner because they have been all along, they just didn't show so much. All right. Number five, blank and blank are always with us. Oppression and injustice are always with us. Now there are fads as to which one we're mad at at the point, at the moment. So you don't need to get caught up in the fads, even in this. You do what God tells you to do, not what your culture is telling you to do. And that leads us to the next one, number six. There will always be peer pressure about something. Sometimes the peer pressure is even something good, but you aren't supposed to be involved in every single good thing there is. So there's even fads about doing good. Well, if you're not involved in, you know, poverty in Somalia, then you're a terrible person. Do what God wants you to do. And peer pressure is not just a teenage thing. It follows you when you grow up, because adults are basically just overgrown teenagers, and there's always pressure for something. Do what God wants you to do. Don't worry about that. Seven, history is always taught with bias. Even if somebody says they're unbiased, they're not. Because every human has a worldview. We have a way of looking at things. And so we look at history and we interpret history through our worldview and our bias. Number eight, according to Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. So everything is just recycled and moving around in humanity. So again, we don't need to get too freaked out about it. Number nine, God is always active in history. Even when it seems like he's not. Study Cory Sundown. 
even through the concentration camp. God is always active through history. And the last one, history is a blank blank for the blank blank. Anybody know what that is? History is a what for the curious mind. Yeah, a never-ending adventure for the curious mind. As long as you stay curious, there's always cool things to learn about. So let's think about that for just a second. There's always something to panic about. So, somebody tell me something that we've learned about that people have panicked about. Haley's Comet. Haley's Comet. Very good. Oh, got them to your insight? <laughs> okay, yes. World War II. World War II, absolutely. Yeah. It's Titanic. That's Titanic. Nuclear bombs. Yes, definitely. The polio effect. Yes, polio, nuclear war. Your ships are sinking. Good grief. There's a war all over the place. Yes. Blue. The flu. All so, what'd you say? Mm, yes, absolutely, definitely. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay, what about number two? Which says, Sad to know jokes from the are also ridiculous. Tell me some fad that was ridiculous. That we learned about. What? Bell bottoms. We didn't learn about that yet. Yeah, Howie. The hair. <laughs> the red lipstick, okay. The flappers. They had about 27 things they were doing. The big poofy hats, yes. The bad boys. The bad boys wear blue jeans. Ooh. Yeah. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. Okay, so fads and ideals come and go. They're often ridiculous. Crisis reveals who people really are. What is a crisis that we've studied about so far? Titanic. The Titanic. You notice some people showed themselves to be heroes. Some people showed themselves to be cowards. Yes. The Great Depression. The Great Depression. Some people just couldn't take it and jumped out the window, literally. And some people got through it. Polio, absolutely. What do you do when you're kissing a machine like that? Cold War. The Cold War. We're scared all the time, but it shows who's going to keep going. C.S. Lewis once wrote something basically like we are in the shadow of nuclear war, so what should we do about it? We should keep living. We should keep going the same way we have been so that if the destruction of the world does come, it finds us being faithful and doing what is right. Yes? All right. Corruption shouldn't surprise us because we live in a sinful world. Have we talked about anybody who's corrupt? Any bad guys? Hitler. Hitler, absolutely. Mussolini. 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 Oh. Yep. Our government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to move on. Okay. No, it's true. Corruption shouldn't surprise us. America's not a perfect country. You should expect there to be corruption because the world's full of sinners. Okay. Okay. So, oppression and injustice are always with us. What is some of the injustice that people have been fighting about through the decades we've learned about? Women's rights. Women's rights, okay. The suffrage movement. Okay. The, the oppression would be the Holocaust, absolutely. The Germans um, living a suppressed life, um, the extreme economy failing, and then the only way out is to follow a maniac mustache. <laughs> There's an assessment from Ryan. All right, there will always be peer pressure about something. Can you think of something through the decades we've studied that people were pressuring other people that they needed to do? Buy stock. Buy stock. That's a good one because obviously it didn't work out so well. Wear a mask. Wear a mask. So everybody's going to die. You can wear a little kissing shield if you need to. Saving the um, prison tax and everything yeah, rationing, saving stuff, helping the war. If you're not doing that, you don't care about the war effort, you don't care about freedom, you're a jerk. Good. History is always taught with bias. I will give you an example of that. I'm teaching history from a biblical worldview. So I like pointing out the people who were Christians. I like pointing out the people who did right, the people who were faithful to God. I like pointing out the God stuff in history, like that guy in the Titanic who preached to people even as the boat was sinking. I'm teaching it with bias in the sense that I think the Bible is the word of God, that it is the truth to live by. And therefore, I want to teach about righteousness and justice and goodness. I'm not up here saying, well, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. You can just make up your own truth. Don't worry about it. And these people over here who are doing wrong, well, let's try to understand them. We're not teaching that way. So, yeah, I'm teaching with a bias. Your parents know it. That's why they're okay with you being here. If I was a communist, I would be teaching with a different bias. If I was an atheist, I would be teaching from a different bias. If I was, there's lots of other ists that I could be, and you would be learning different things about history. 
So be careful who you listen to. Number eight, there is nothing new under the sun. What's something that happened and then it's like, oh, we're back here again? World War. World War, yeah. The war to end all wars. Oh, wait, never mind. American debt. There was a huge American debt before the stock market, and now we're building up to the Okay. Party because you can. Party because you can. That showed up here. Now it's showing up here. It's going to show up again. The pandemic. The pandemic. That's true. It's not a new thing. Or even pressuring everybody that, you know, you got to wear a mask and people saying, no, we shouldn't wear a mask. And diseases. Yeah, diseases. They're always going to keep coming. We're not going to fix it all. Absolutely. There's this horrible thing that's going to happen, and now here we are again. <laughs> yes, that's true, too. World War. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. That's true. Yeah. Okay. God is always active in history. Where is that? Have we seen God do stuff through these, these decades that we've studied? He's always stuff out and take out him. Okay. back on our feet. Um, we learned about a bunch of individual people who through a time of great sinfulness and great evil showed themselves strong because God was on their side. That's when God shows up. Um, the Bible itself is a history lesson. Absolutely. Definitely. And those who follow it are different. And that's where we should be. We should be. We should shine as lights in the darkness and the darker it gets, the more the believers should shine. Okay, history is a never-ending adventure for the curious mind. We are out of time. Next week, you're going to find out about the Big Huge Project. You can learn like 500 points on. Um, you're going to learn some other ways to look earn points. And we're going to talk about the 1960s. So you can wear psychedelic outfits if you want. Cat glasses and boot on. Bye, y'all. Oh, the frisbees are yours.